welcome to Think Tech Hawaii. <laughs> the domain of CEO Jay Fidel, Professor Emerita Vernelia Randall from the University of Dayton School of Law, who has pioneered some things in truth-seeking ventures that have achieved a level of opposition that approximates their value. The harder people fight it, the more valuable it is. T.K. Brown Taylor, a mediator, and a sage well beyond her years. We're talking today about education being under attack. And all four of us, I believe it's fair to say, are people who believe deeply in and are devoted to the value of education, of learning, and of people sharing learning to help each other through things that would be much more difficult without the learning that they can share and offer. So, Vernelia, how do we protect learning now? And what kind of attacks is it under? Learning, education and learning, I mean, there's two different things. And I, I want to be sure that I distinguish that. Because you can learn without getting an education. Uh, you can be committed to knowing and trying to understand the truth of the environment that you're in. And, and that can be gained without necessarily an education. And education is important uh, because it helps you in that process. You don't have to do it so independently and you don't have to necessarily do it trial and error. And it's important to be able to gain certain skills that makes going through life easier. So I think education and learning, my, my grandfather started Jarvis Christian College. It wasn't Jarvis Christian College at the time. It was um, uh, Jarvis pr uh, Primary School back in 1912 so that all his grandkids, so, so that all his kids could be educated. So I come from a family that believes in education and learning and, and that has continued. Uh, it's under attack, both learning and education is under attack. And education has been under attack for at least 30 years, maybe 40 as far as I'm concerned, it, 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 the, it's, it, they, it, the attack has been sort of eating around the edges so that people wouldn't notice that it was being attacked. And it's at all levels. It's at uh, K through 12, it's at college, it's at uh, JD, MD, it, that education has been under cap. What is really kind of surprising to me is how overt learning has come under attack. That people seem to be attacking knowing things as if that is uh, somehow elitist to be able to say that you know things and that you know accurate things and that you are able to convey the that knowledge and that accuracy. TK, what concerns you about what's happening in learning environments? Yeah, I, I want to say first, and thank you so much. I'm always grateful and glad to be here on Think Tech, but I love that Professor Randall started with the difference between learning and education because I co-signed because you can get as much knowledge, as much information as you possibly can and have not learned anything because learning is a change in behavior. So I love that we are having the conversation around education, but also the difference of, of, of learning. And so your question in terms of what I believe um, the attack on learning, and I think it's, it, and we opened up we were kind of having this conversation, if you will, kind of opening up here. It's been going for a while. I, I don't think this is is new. Um, I think it's 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 just this resurgence, if you will, of just 
on every angle, every turn. It it it's it it feels like an all out war. When you think of war of going and and having you know with firearms and bombs and it it, it has that feeling. It feels like a war. You can't say anything. You can't think anything. You uh, you can't be critical, analytical on every angle, and it's so unfortunate. And I almost I almost pulled up the letter I was tapped because one of a, a, a community colleague um, here where I live near Augusta, Georgia and, and places all over the country learning was being attacked at the K-12 level. And we're talking about higher ed, but I think it's it's been kind of uprooted through all of this where there were books being banned right here. And because um, one of the leaders wasn't able to go speak to the school board, she called and said, hey, could you stand in for me? And I almost pulled that letter and brought it today and and, and read a couple excerpts from it. Um, but it really was questioning, posed all types of questions around to the school board, around reading being fundamental and like, being able to expose young people to diverse bodies of work that do we not want to expose them to think critically outside of the, their homes in the schoolhouse are we preparing them to be able to do these type things and so learning uh, it's unfortunate but that it is certainly where we are where um not only higher education but as professor rondo said our k-12 teachers you know our school librarians you know are facing gag orders book bans all these types of critical i mean all these these accusations around critical thinking. Um, and so it's just unfortunate because I don't think we're preparing our young people to, to, to take over when we're no longer here to be great leaders and to, to run the world without us. We're not preparing them if we're not helping them and encouraging them to think critically about things. I, I want to just quick comment. I think we're preparing them for what we want. I think we have for 30, 40 years wanted to prepare people to be low wage people who cannot fight the environment they're in because they're not academically, they don't have the preparation to do that. And I think there's class stuff going on. Because that's not happening. The pe people are still being educated. People are still learning. It's just the masses aren't giving it. And that's deliberate. That's not uh, an accident. That's done to control the masses. I would agree with I would agree with that. Me being a person. And I was trying to think of of, of that famous quote in, in Dr. King's. Um, but even if we, because I'm a woman of faith, if we go biblically, you know, when we think about, and I agree with that because um, it, it 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 is the masses, but it's a small few desire that that does not want to prepare. I don't think that's the desire of most families, most parents, most communities. But it is a a very few that is able to control the narrative. Um, whether that be how 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 education is funded, I was sharing just the mere fact of how accreditation funding is attached to accreditation, and that being going back to the word you use, classism and economics and communities where it, economics don't allow for, if you will, um. um the, the level in terms of how accreditation is structured and institutionalized. And so I think I agree with you in that regard in that, but I think where I would pull away would be is that there are a few who are controlling that narrative for, or for the masses. And because the masses, I don't want to say uneducated, but I often say this all the time, is that if you look how we as a country are ranked in the world, <laughs> we are nowhere in the top 10, top 20, top 50, but somewhere, somehow, every time there is a political war, uh, you know, military war, whatever type of 
um, we're always at the center of it to. But, yeah, I, I agree with you, but I think the desire, I, I'm not saying what people desire. I think the masses desire for their kids to have a better life than they have. I think the masses desire for their children to be uh, uh, have a better education they have and a better learning than they have. But I don't think the system is designed for them to be able to follow through on that. I did some studies. Uh, one of the studies I've done was on the state of Ohio K through 12 school discipline. I did a study of the whole state. And what came out of that study was that Black children was being disproportionately disciplined at every age level, including kindergarten, being kicked out, being, and that every, we know that when you disrupt a child's schooling for whatever reason you think is important you disrupt their learning and when they come from poor families or working class it doesn't have to just be poor family shit um i was a working class family where my oldest son looked care of my youngest son and if my oldest son had gotten in trouble it would have affected more than just him because I was single and that was the way it was. But the study showed that uh, so kids are being discharged, dismissed, and it got greater and greater every year. Now, what we know about that is that affects learning, how they read, that affects uh, whether or not they want to stay in school, and the dropout rate by seventh grade, kids started dropping out. You could track it. It's almost like they tried as hard as they can, but seventh grade, they started dropping out, and dropout rate hit high around ninth grade. Now, what we know about that is that Imprisonment, people who go to prison have a high dropout rate around ninth grade and higher. So we have a system designed because the kids can't read at grade level, even the ones who are graduating, because we've set up a system to artificially protect some group of people from kid, having large number of kids who can't read, who can't write, who can't add, and we don't care. I mean, not, when I say we, I'm talking about the universal we. The people, because those kids are designed to meet us a societal need, and that societal need is to be malleable. Is that the right word? To be where they don't have as many choices because they can't think, they can't do critical thinking, can't do critical reading, they can't do math. <laughs> it's, you know, and it's not the kids' fault. It's the structure of society. No, and I agree with you. I think we're saying the same thing, and that's what I was sharing about yeah. accreditation and economics and that, it, it, and everything that you're talking about now is is what's very prevalent, the school to prison pipeline. And that's a very exactly. real, a lot of research and studies um, data around that. Uh, and that goes back to what I was kind of sharing and that how education is tied to money and how money is controlled and funneled and controlled, and, you know, by certain groups um, that it keeps individuals in poverty. And we know that Literacy is connected to poverty and that is connected to people not living productive lives, meaning going into crime and crime usually for survival, not because they're bad people, but just because they're survival, they don't have the skills. Um, and so we know if a child doesn't have 
have friends that are into, you know, run literacy nonprofits. And, and they're often talking about if a child is not reading on grade level or proficiently at age three. So we have three years from the time they come out the womb. <laughs> and if they're not, it's high probability that they are going to go into a life of crime if the education in school and how we say here in this space, we just kind of agreed on learning a change in behavior. If we don't tackle that in three years, then we we likely fail that young person. Um, so we got to get in there really, really early. And Jay, Jay you had shared with us earlier eh, a look back learning from history in 1933 eh, when one of Hitler's central strategies and tenets was to not only mandate and advocate, but to enforce intolerance and division in the schools, in society, in the military. Are we seeing that again? Well, you guys have convinced me that education is broken. I kind of knew that before. And it's been broken since I went to school. It, it, it was very, very different when I was a kid. It was very different when I was uh, in high school and college and, and law school. Um, and it certainly has declined. And your and your portrayal of it is, is accurate, um, but it, it paints a picture of, of a failure of education. And a failure of education means ultimately a failure of the society. And we, we can't have a, a civil society. We can't have an intelligent electorate if people don't know what's going on. It's simple as that. Um, to go to Hitler, um, you know, recently uh, Netflix uh, posted a, a show called Hitler and the Nazis, and it it's very good. It's a documentary. It's worth seeing. It has footage you haven't seen before. And it's uh, the first uh, couple of uh, episodes. There are six altogether. Um, deal with what Hitler's program was, how he got to be Hitler. He was um, he was a failed artist in Vienna, and uh, he tried a, a thing at a beer hall, uh, trying to bring the government down. It was um, it was a feckless attempt, and he failed and went to jail. And uh, from there he wrote Mein Kampf, and from there he came back. And this time he understood how to do things. One of the things that he did, as Chuck mentioned, is he he took control of the schools. He realized that if he got kids at an early age and taught them his agenda, they would belong to him. And uh, his agenda was to um, convince people that Germany was in terrible shape, which was not necessarily true. We're talking about truth here. He lied to people about the condition of the country. He made them feel it wasn't working. He made them feel that a liberal democracy was was a failure in Germany. Um, and, and he used the schools uh, to build an agenda among a whole generation of kids and ultimately high school kids and college kids that, that Germany had failed. And the only way to salvation was to make Hitler uh, the fearless leader, the Fuhrer. <clears throat> now, this is a very interesting playbook. Um, this playbook is, um, is is detailed in the series that I mentioned. And, but we, we knew this before. We knew what Hitler did. We're reluctant sometimes to make the comparison. But I think these days we can make the comparison. So now you find, um, you know, these people, it all came out of a college, actually, in, I think, West Virginia uh, or the western part of Virginia. Um, and, a, and a teacher there by the name of Buchanan, not the president. It was another person named James Buchanan, a Howley guy who had it on his mind um, that we had to uh, get back to the Civil War, keep fighting the Civil War. Um, and um, he he got the Koch brothers um, to back him up financially. And after a while, his plan became, by the early 2000s, a reality. He died in, the, in 1998 or so. Um, and that reality you know, spread around to the GOP and ultimately to Trump uh, and, and the MAGAs. 
And part of the MAGA's agenda is the same thing as Hitler. You have to control those kids. You have to convince people that the system is broken. And then you have to replace the system with your own self um, and show and tell people, convince them, um, lie to them, uh, convince them that you're you're the one. And they have to get behind you. And they have to change the way kids are taught in schools. And that's a really sad thing. Uh, because, you know, when I went to school, I was telling you guys before the show, it cost me $12 a semester uh, at Queens College in the City University of New York. Um, it was a, an, an open university. Uh, Queens itself was a community of, of uh, immigrants, of diversity in every which way. Um, and the school was a reflection of that. It was a city school. It was a reflection of Queens. And other schools in, in New York were you know, similarly organized. Um, but over time, you find that to go to school in this country, to go to college in this country, costs a fortune. Somewhere along the way, the schools became big business. Chuck and I can tell you that um, uh, maybe 20 years ago in Hawaii, the University of Hawaii president was paid more than half a million dollars a year. Now, that really shocked me. Uh, I don't. I'm, I was never paid more than that, and I taught at the law school for a little while. Um, uh, uh, really, <laughs> I, I, I hope you were paid that much, but I don't think you were. And TK had the same for you, and Chuck the same for you. He, not only did this guy was paid this extraordinary amount, but he was able to bring all his friends in, and they had a cadre of people all being paid extraordinary amounts. Um, and so, uh, what happened there? And then you have you know, student loans, and student loans were a way for the universities to build bigger, more expensive infrastructure. I mean, faculty infrastructure and raise those salaries and compete for faculty talent. And before you know it, it became a national phenomenon, very expensive and very untouchable. Um, and, and education was actually uh, lower on the, on the scale in terms of importance. So I, I relish my days back when, and I'm sad to see what happened now, and I agree with you that it's broken. But I would put to you the question, how do you fix it? Because you, you can't just let it stay broken. If you do that, we are not going to have an educated electorate. Uh, we are not going to have people who can enter into positions of power and management. Um, we need to change the, you know, we need to change things. And um, how do we do that? Let me, let me ask Chuck to ask you guys, how do we do that? It's not only race, by the way. It's everything in these colleges. They're not working for us. They're, they're creating a, a country that is mm, bound for disaster, in my opinion. I, I just want to comment. That was so powerful, Jay. And something that you were talking that resonated me, that made me think, And because I, I hadn't, but you painted it very well, the correlation and connection to Hitler and the war on education today. And that when I think about when my parents went to school where the college and the universities, that was where things got done because young people, and I think our generation has come out of that where we, the, the 60, 70, that generation wanted to stand and have a voice and were walking out of colleges. Like they were, if you didn't have the colleges and universities in political campaign and community and social involved in social issues, they were a big voice. And so I think the, the, that the minority that are in control are very aware where we were in the 60s and 70s and how the colleges and camp and camp college campuses and higher education was used so powerfully to protest and to 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 um, determine how we as a country and how we as a people would live. So I could certainly see how the world education it's in. Oh, remember the 70s? <laughs> we do not want to allow young people because we know our young people today, we thought them, we taught, we have taught Generation Z, Y, X, millennials to question everything. <laughs> A question and verify everything. And so um, I do, that is just so, just kind of, it's like a, like a glaring in how you paint it. 
just the, the 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 thoughts around how Hitler manipulated until we can take some of those same concepts into today, create this war on education, control on education, because we don't want to go back to where we as a country where college and campuses and universities were were, were a big part of how we would live and how we would legislate ourselves. You know, I, I just want to I want to throw point. one thing in. You know, we've seen uh, lately that even beginning on October eighth, the day after the attack on Israel, the day after, the very day after, kids on college campuses, kids in the in the cities were on the streets, um, and they were um, protesting for um, the Palestinians. The day after the attack on Israel, uh, and some of them were protesting, increasingly protesting in favor of Hamas. And these are kids, you know, who really mm, didn't have a course in social sciences that would have, you know, helped them understand the priorities there. So I think it's an X, Y axis, if you don't mind me saying. On, on the one side, you have the need to take positions, to speak on public issues and international issues like that. And that's a good thing. And that did happen during the Vietnam War. Um, and, and that was beneficial, ultimately beneficial for the country, uh, although not for some of the kids who were killed in Kent State. Um, at the same time, you know, what I was describing was a, a, a borough, Queensboro, of, of immigrants, of diverse students in all the schools. And what was their mission in life? It was to learn. They would they would not spend a whole lot of time in protest. They would be home studying. And if they didn't do well, if they dropped out in the seventh grade, for example, um, their parents would be all over them with a baseball bat. What's the matter, you? How, mm -hmm. how come you're not studying today? You better do your homework and you better finish school. And that was a like 100 percent phenomenon in my time. Now we have kids who do not study, but who protest all the time and who protest about things of which they are ignorant, I'm sorry to say. Uh, and the X, Y axis between those two factors, those two competing factors has changed. And it's part, in my opinion, it's part of the of the phenomenon that the, the schools are broken. I was going to say, I think you're living in a way we were, Sandra. From You remember the song from Barbara Streisand? the way we were. We always believe that our past life is so much was so much better than what's going on now. Maybe what you what you described may be true for you, but it wasn't true for me. I lived in a time when there were dropouts. I lived in a time when uh, parents you know, did the best they could, but it wasn't keeping necessarily keeping their kids in school. I lived in a time where I protested 60s, 70s, about things that were going on. And I don't begrudge, and I don't, I hate to go down this, but I got to say it, I don't begrudge the protests against Israel the day after because people have been living with these issues for more than a day. And so to some people, they have the knowledge and understanding that can cause them to protest. But that's, I, I and then some people not. Nah. I was going to give this real life example that literally just happened two days ago. So I probably shouldn't say who does it, but we gave, there's five scholarships. And I'm just going to say my church, my church gives five educational scholarships every year. And one young man took all five home. And the reason he took all, and there's a committee you know, made up of various people throughout the church who sit on it voluntarily, who decide who, based on the criteria that's determined by, you know, policy within the church, that's been longstanding, you know, and obviously it's reviewed and changed and updated. 
like my church is going through this thing right now. And this just happened. I wasn't even there on Sunday. Of course, me and my husband sat and watched it th this past, you know, a couple days ago. And the parents, okay, let me beg up. One young man took home every single one of the scholarships. And in that service, uh, 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 another gentleman got up, asked for the chair if he could say a word at the end. Because he was displeased, he observed that it was unfair to the other students who were sitting on the front row who did not receive anything, not knowing, and, and, and no, excuse me, knowing because the, the chair informed him because he said it in his speech as he said he would, would give $500 to each or $1,500 to each one of the students who did not receive a scholarship because education is so expensive to, to Jay's point. Neither one of those students for the past three months that it's been announced every single Sunday did any of the work, filled out the application, none of that. <laughs> and so because one student got emotional, the church, different, I won't say the entire church, but various people um, got alarmed, got, you know, worked up. Um, and so the pastor had to address it at the end. And he did such an amazing job, me viewing it after the fact, how he how he atti attached it to grace and rewards and all of that. But the reality is, to, to, I think two things. <laughs> is we don't even, there is a war on education. There are institutional practices and policies to keep a certain set of, and, and I would say even a great, Mat, uh, of the masses in a certain position. The other part of that, I do believe, is one, we don't value education. Like somewhere we have begun to not value it. And, 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 and I say that because I, colleagues of mine, friends of mine, when we sit out and we go out and we see other cultures and, and, and things of that nature, that right now, one of my family members has an exchange student and she's been with her a year and a half. How they value education and exposing children. Just how even like the technical spaces right now, the plumbings, the electricians, there's such a great need. We're forcing people to go to college. Again, I think it's institutionalized where all the high schools, K through 12, talk about nothing but college, get these families and people in debt. <laughs> so now they're always at the at the beckoning of big business and the people who are behind college institutions. And oh, by the way, I just learned this not long ago that when loans, the, the whole concept behind loans and, and um, educational grants, there's a protection. And I know it to be true because I have had, it took me 20 plus years to pay off school loans, is that you know how without getting long-winded, school loans are one of the only type of debt that cannot be included in bankruptcy. That's right. Again, going back to big business, protecting their interests and grants and the way grants and loans came into be where there was some sort of handshake deal where if we don't include, if you agree not to include, allow educational loans to be included in bankruptcy, then we'll fund it in this kind of way. Um, and of course, I'm I'm talking from something I read probably several years ago. Um, but even, even that, how all these things are just systematic. You're describing a society that is building, may I say, or perpetuating indentured servitude. You belong to whoever made you that loan and you have to pay it back. And it is okay. a shadow on your whole life. And Biden was right to cancel that those loans, but I, I would, I would persist in suggesting to you, Chuck, that you ask these guys what the solution is. It is broken in every aspect you can think of. Professor Randall, hey, when you were faculty, a professor at the University of Dayton School of Law, hey, respected, admired, authoritative, knowledgeable, hey, you saw a class, a group of people who were undervalued, devalued, excluded, disserved, precluded from access to that law school learning. And you did something to enable young people from that group 
to gain that access and to make those opportunities work for them. What did you do? Okay, thank you. I did two things. First of all, I bugged them about admission every year, looked at the numbers, got on the admission committee whenever I could, and bugged them about the standards that they use were just screening standards. That they really that 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 there was no real relationship to whether a person could come to law school with the support necessary and then finish and become a lawyer. I then insisted because the law school I went to had a 50% failure rate for black students. This is their study. Before they hired me, they had done, uh, they had a 50% failure rate of black students every year for 20 years. Didn't matter how many students they admit. It was like, okay, we admit two, one's going to survive. We admit 10, five is going to survive. And I said to them that that was unacceptable. And, and they said, well, what can we do? And I said, we can start an academic support program. They didn't believe in it. They did it to appease me, which was just fine. I didn't care. And uh, I ran a program which actually helped all the students. It wasn't just for Black students. It was for uh, the students, uh, uh, students of color, disabled students, just any student that would be disadvantaged, statistically disadvantaged. And I uh, ran the program and I started the summer before they got into law school and then ran it the first year. I did not focus on teaching them the law because that's people want to think that it's about learning the law now. It's about learning how to survive in law school and how to do well, how to study, what's the secret sauce sort of thing. And so when I first started, their attitude was, oh, do whatever you want. These students aren't fit for law school because they that's why they flunk out. And if you if you want to spend your time trying to help them, go right ahead. So then as my program gained success, success not only in the students passing the first year, but doing well in law school and passing the bar, which is always the sign that people, then it was... Well, yeah, you could teach anyone to do something. That doesn't mean they don't know something. And so then I kind of <laughs> ignored that. And so then it was, and I did this for about 10 years. As we got more established with more success, it became, it's an unfair advantage. The very same, and we're not talking about new people. The faculty who said to me, do whatever you want because these students can't succeed and you're wasting your time, said to me later, it's an unfair advantage. Uh, and as soon as I quit doing the program, they closed it down, so, despite its years of success. But uh, uh, Chuck, to me, that is... As a public, I was a public health nurse before I went to law school. And as a public health nurse, you understand that you can help the individual, but you have to change the system. Because if you don't change the system, the individuals are just going to keep coming through, you know, and you might be able to help a few. I helped a few, and I'm very happy that I did that. But there are hundreds of thousands that I didn't help because the system of legal education is broken. And yet it's broken in terms of how it admits people. It's broken in terms of how it educate people. I used, I actually wrote an article that called it incompetent. If it, if it was for anyone else but lawyers, we would have sued ourselves 
over the the educational <laughs> process in law school. And the bar is broken. The, the requiring doing well on a written exam to prove that you have the skills necessary to practice is ludicrous. Mm -hmm, because mm -hmm. all it really tests is test taking skills. Exactly. And so you what you get is a lot of people who fail the test who are going to be great attorneys if they could just get past that damn bar exam. Um so yeah, that's 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 what I did. I actually did the uh, program too to show that you could teach people how to pass the bar as well. And I did that for a couple of years. But that I was getting ready to say that's as what I did was uh, was, and this goes to Jay's question. What I did was help the individual. I didn't change the system at all. The system in which I operated stayed the same, tolerated the change that I did, and as soon as they could, they got rid of it. So the real question for me is how you change the system in a way that they can't go back. Because what I think is the way we do politics in this society is always, they're going to always go back to whoever it is. We are in the phrase we're in now because the conservatives played a long game on the liberals by packing the courts, district courts and Supreme Court. And now we have a situation where if we don't unpack the court, we could be living with this for 50, 60, 70 years before we get laws that are helpful. As far as changing systems, I don't know how you do that. My son taught in K through 12 and his he's got two kids that are in uh in going into high school and this school district the orlando school district which is not different from other school districts actually instructs their instructors not to send a grade home less than 50. I think what that means your child, this is how come the people are not doing the work at your church. Because they're being taught that they don't have to do the work. They go to school. They don't turn stuff in. They get a 50. They get a chance to do it over again. And that's not, that's, that's not, that's every school district. Every school district is doing that because they don't want these schools are fit. These students are failing in the third grade and they know it, but they keep passing them on. And then they graduate them from high school. They can't read. They can't write, but they got a high school diploma. And on top of that, they've been taught. They have not. They've been taught the opposite of being a good student. They've been taught be bad students so i don't know how you change this system I, I my answer is the zombie apocalypse one more time zombie apocalypse okay we're about out of time for today jay last thoughts i think the parents at home have a responsibility not only in kindergarten and grade school and high school, but in college and for graduate school. And they have to help these kids appreciate the value of education, how education can shape your life going forward. Um, and, and um, you know, in, in general, um, to study as a high priority. And to learn and 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 go beyond where the teacher is going, and unfortunately, I I think that over the years since I described my own childhood, that that's changed too. People people say, well, the schools are in local parentis. 
um, and they will take care of my child. They will make that motivation, uh, and they don't. So the result is nobody makes the motivation. So I think this has to be a combined effort. I have to just jump in. Jay, many, many parents, and I would say the majority of the parents, are working two jobs to just try to get by. They're not at home because they can't be at home because they got, we we have our men, our wages are low. People don't make enough money to afford rent. In fact, uh, uh, I saw some study that there's no state in the United States where minimum wage will get you a two room apartment. And so you've got people who are working two jobs the parents who, two parent families who are working four jobs, both of them are working two jobs, and they're passing in the night. And then when their kid comes home with a grade that is passing, of course they want to believe that's true. I don't think the parents are necessarily slacking on wanting them to get an education. I think they're caught up in a system where they can't pay attention any they can't pay attention because they're overworked with not enough time. So you're expanding this whole notion of the system is broken to the whole society is broken. Where, where That's people, what I mean by the, yeah, absolutely. It's not just schools, it's not just kids, it's not just doing your homework. It's the whole enchilada. That's what we got here. But that's another show, isn't it, Chuck? It is. <laughs> and we'll, we'll get to that. Thank TK. you so much. Hey, TK, you want to wrap us up? Well, this has been a really awesome conversation. And, and if I had to answer that question, I don't think it's a one-pointed answer. But the, for me, personally, the, the things go back to we need to bring the village back. We need to bring prayer back in the schools. We've taken God out of everything. Um, and I know, you know, people say, well, we don't want to be religious. But, you know, I was in the therapist's office, physical therapist's office, and I walked in on four women, seasoned, <laughs> all of them over 80. And they were talking about a recent shooting we had here. And I made the comment, well, you all, and they were talking about schools and children. And um, you all let them take prayer out the schools. <laughs> Um, and so I just think it's a it's a combination of things. And I do believe we need to bring the village back where everybody believes that every child is a part of their community. And if they live in your community at some place, they're going to take touch your grocery store. They're going to touch your workplace. They're going to touch, you know, your, your children's extracurricular activities. So that would help us continue to place a va the value on education or raise the bar on placing the value on education because we're just in a place where unless we do those two things where everybody cares, then it's going to be really difficult to go back to the point Professor Randall brought up. <laughs> everybody wants to work, ride in the six-figure you know, six houses, six-figure cars, and they got to pay for all that stuff. So how are they going to pay for it? <laughs> And those who can't, the other extreme of, of, of that spectrum is, is that the, there are ones who are forced to live in under the living wage who are who are required to work, you know, that many jobs to just to survive. And so there is no middle. And so we need everybody all hands on deck to keep us all informed um, and everybody caring about caring about the topic and that, again, education is value. And I wanted to thank all of you, Professor Randall, TK, Jay, for speaking from the heart as well as the mind, connecting the heart and the mind with how we see life, because that has to be the heart and the spirit of learning. And we have to learn together in order to be able to learn to live together.